Figurative language. Figurative language is language that goes beyond the literal meaning of a word, and authors will use figurative language to enhance their writing. Some common examples of figurative language are hyperbole, simile, metaphor, and personification. So we'll discuss each of those and I'll give you some examples for each. Hyperbole is exaggeration. People will say something and you aren't meant to take it literally. You're meant to know it's an exaggeration, but it's there just to emphasize how strongly the author is trying to convey something. For instance, I've told you a million times. I bet some of you have probably heard that one. And a million times, really, probably you haven't heard whatever your parent or teacher has said they've told you a million times. It's an exaggeration. It's hyperbole. It's meant to emphasize that they've already told you this a lot more times before now. Another example would be, I had a ton of homework. You did not literally go home with 2,000 pounds of homework, but you're telling people, I had a lot of homework. It was way more than the normal amount. It was a ton. It was that much homework. So that's what hyperbole is, exaggeration. Next, we've got simile, which is comparing two things using like or as. And this is very important. You have to use those words like or as or it's not going to be a simile anymore. So, the child howled like a coyote. We see our word like. You're comparing two things in this sentence. The child howled like a coyote compares the child to a coyote using the word like. This example is letting you know that the child is loud. It's crying sounds like a howl, much like a coyote. So this figurative language is used to bring a coyote to mind to help you picture and hear in your mind how this child is screaming or crying. Next, let's look at this example. She ran as fast as lightning. Well, that's going to compare two things here, and we see the word as. So what is being compared in this sentence? She ran as fast as lightning. And usually when you have one as, you've got two. So it's comparing she, or a girl, to lightning. And that is being done by using the word as. So when you're comparing a girl to lightning, you're saying she's that fast. It went so fast you barely got to see her before she got past you or got to the finish line. So it's just letting you know she's really, really fast. So that's what simile is, comparing two things using like or as. And again, these are the important words to look for to make it actually be a simile. It could be a metaphor, which compares two things without using like or as. And that is really the big difference between a simile and a metaphor. A simile uses like or as. A metaphor does not use like or as. So let's look at some metaphor examples. She was lightning running down the track. So this sentence is very similar to this one. They're both comparing she or a girl to lightning. They're both saying this girl is really fast, but this one just says she was lightning. She was lightning running down the track. It doesn't say she ran as fast as lightning. It doesn't use like or as, it just says she was lightning. So it's a different way to use the same kind of figurative language. So that's one example of a metaphor. Let's look at this, and this is an excerpt from Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Raven. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. Now this one's a little trickier, because it doesn't just come out and say, this was this, or this is this, like here it said she was lightning. 
but it says that his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. So we're comparing his eyes to a demon's eyes, which is basically comparing him or a man to a demon. If his eyes are like a demon's eyes, then this man is being compared to a demon, which is to maybe say that the man is evil. It doesn't mean he's literally a demon. It means he's got some characteristic of a demon. He's maybe an evil person. So in poetry, your figurative language may not always pop out at you if it's a metaphor. A simile is pretty easy to spot because you'll see like or as. But a metaphor might be a little trickier. So just look for what two things are being compared in that sentence or that phrase of a poem. And the last piece of figurative language we're going to discuss is personification, which is when an inanimate object is given human qualities. You are personifying it. You are making it do something a person would do, even though it's not something that can do these things. And remember, inanimate objects are going to be things that are not alive. A chair, a teapot, the wind, water, those are inanimate objects. So the example here, the water slapped the side of the boat. The water slapped. Can water actually slap like a person would slap? No, but it makes you think of the action of slapping and the sound you might hear with the slap whenever you picture this water slapping the side of the boat. And that's why they're using this particular word and personifying the water. Depending on what the story is about where this sentence appears, it could be that the water is being made as like a, an evil character. If someone drowns in this story, then the water would be seen as an enemy, and so it slapping the side of the boat would give it that negative feeling. Another example, the teapot shrieked. Shrieking, screaming, that loud sound, you can hear it in your head when you think about the noise a teapot makes. But a teapot isn't actually shrieking like a person would. It's simply making that noise because the air is hot enough that it's trying to get out now. Or the wind howled. Wind can't howl like a wolf would howl, but wind makes that same kind of sound sometimes. And so the author is trying to put that sound of howling in your mind when they're describing the wind. So figurative language can be a lot of different things. Hyperbole, where you're exaggerating. Simile, where you're comparing two things using like or as. Very important markers for a simile. Metaphor, where you're comparing two things without using like or as. And personification, when an object is given human qualities, whenever it's personified. And all of these techniques are used so that the words will go beyond the literal meaning of them and give you a deeper understanding of the poem or the work that you're reading. The author is trying to go beyond the words and make you really think about their meaning and put certain connotations in your head whenever you're reading. Context. Sometimes when you're reading and you come across a word that you don't know, you can use context clues to make an educated guess as to what the word means. Now when you're looking at the word you don't know, you don't want to just look right before and after the word. You usually want to look at the sentence before and the sentence after. And sometimes you even have to look at the whole paragraph to get an idea of what that unfamiliar word means. Now, there are some clues that we can look at to help determine what the word means. One thing you can look at is a description. Sometimes a sentence or a sentence following or before the unfamiliar word will give you a description. For instance, the green feathered macaw. Well, you may not know the word macaw, but by seeing green feathered, you can infer that it is some kind of a bird with green feathers. Another clue you could look at are synonyms. If you hear the soft and supple leather, well, since you have soft here and then supple, both describing leather, you can figure out that supple probably has something to do with being soft. 
and in reality it means moldable it's easily moldable and it is somewhat soft to be able to do that we'll go ahead and note that this one was our bird now another clue you can look for are antonyms angie is sweet she doesn't have a malevolent bone in her body well you may not know what malevolent means but you probably know what sweet means and if she isn't malevolent and she is sweet then you can figure out malevolent is something bad something negative the opposite of sweet and in reality malevolent means evil another clue you can look for are definitions sometimes the sentence before after or part of the same sentence your word is in will just give you the definition of the word for instance the echidna an egg-laying mammal native to Australia and then they might tell you some interesting fact about the echidna. Well, in commas, right after echidna is the definition of an echidna. An egg-laying mammal native to Australia. So you know what it is right there. The last clue you can look for is tone. Is the rest of this paragraph positive, negative, happy, scared? If you have a paragraph that's all one tone, then the word probably has something to do with that. If it's a scary tone, then this may be a word that it has to do with something scary. If it's positive, it may be a happy kind of word. So you can always take that into consideration whenever you are taking your educated guess. So once you've looked at clues and you've tried to figure out looking before and after the sentence your word is in, looking at the whole paragraph, seeing if you can find a description, a synonym, an antonym, a definition, or figure out the tone surrounding that unfamiliar word, you want to take a guess as to what the word means. And then you want to reread the sentence to see if it makes sense to you and ask yourself, does it make sense? So if we were to insert bird here, the green feathered bird, well, something that has feathers and we have bird after it, that makes sense, so that one would work. The soft and supple leather. So if we know it means something else soft, maybe moldable, we could say the soft and moldable leather, the soft and flexible leather. Any kind of word like that that you put in that was similar to soft would work. It would make sense in your sentence. Okay, we were thinking evil here, something the opposite of sweet. Angie is sweet. She doesn't have an evil bone in her body. That makes sense. She is sweet. She doesn't have an evil bone. Now, the echidna sentence is a little different. If they plug in a definition for you, then it's a little harder to check. You would just say an egg-laying mammal native to Australia and then maybe tell the sentence after that point because the definition's already there for you. There's not really a synonym for echidna or anything else you could have come up with for what that one meant. And once you've checked to make sure they all make sense, then you have a pretty good idea of what that word means. And you can see how using these context clues of looking for a description, a synonym, an antonym, a definition, or the tone of a paragraph can help you figure out that pesky, unfamiliar word. Allusion. Allusion is an unsighted but recognizable reference to something else. Usually it's going to be a reference to something else in literature. Authors use allusions to make their own text richer. When an author uses an allusion, it gives their own writing the same significance or context that the allusion had. Let's look at some examples. Martin Luther King Jr. started his I Have a Dream speech by saying five score years ago. This is a clear allusion to President Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Lincoln started with four score and seven years ago. So even though Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't saying the exact same thing, he started out with five score years ago, which is similar enough that people knew he was alluding to President Lincoln's speech. This reminded people of the significance of the event. 
And in reminding people of the significance of the Gettysburg Address, it lent significance to the speech that Martin Luther King was making. Let's look at some, some other examples. Scrooge. If someone is alluded to as Scrooge, or there's a Scrooge reference in writing, it's going to be someone who is not very generous. They're kind of miserly. They don't like to share. And that would be something that you would have seen in A Christmas Carol, where he goes around and sees what his life would be like if he weren't there and realizes to change his ways. But Scrooge was a very miserly man who didn't want to share with people who really needed it. If you see Pinocchio, it's a reference to someone who is lying. If you see a Trojan horse, it means someone who, or something that is a trick. It looks like the real thing, but really there's a trap concealed inside. An Achilles heel is a reference to Achilles from Greek mythology, and his heel was his one weak spot. So your Achilles heel would be your weak spot where someone could really get to you. A Romeo from Romeo and Juliet. Romeo would be someone who was really good with women, someone who really loved to, you know, take girls out on dates and was really good at, you know, getting girls to go out on dates with them. Turn the other cheek is a biblical reference when Jesus told people that they shouldn't seek revenge but should instead turn the other cheek if they're slapped once. Turn the other cheek so you can get hit on the other side of your face. And it's just his metaphor for saying don't seek revenge. That's not the Christian way. Solomon is another biblical reference. He was a very wise king, so if you're referred to as um, someone who's like Solomon, it means you've got a lot of wisdom. And a good Samaritan is another biblical reference, and it refers to the good Samaritan on the road who helped someone when no one else would. So a good Samaritan today is someone who helps people or helps a person that no one else is trying to help. So allusions can be used to ground text in a particular time or place, or they can use a cultural reference to make readers feel included. There are lots of reasons that a writer would use allusions, but every time that you use an allusion, it's meant to make your text richer and give your text more than it had before. So when you're reading, watch for allusions. And if you see one of these references, say to yourself, oh, that's an allusion. I learned about those. It's here to make the text richer. And think to yourself, what connotations do you get? How do you feel differently reading that word in the text? What did that word or reference do for your interpretation of the text? Because really, that's what allusion is there for. It's to add to the text and make it better. In this video, we want to go over prefixes. Prefixes are short little sections of words that come before the root of a word and help you understand what the word means. They add uh, an extra nuance to the word and why prefixes and suffixes, for that matter, are important. Prefixes coming before the root of the word, suffixes, short little endings after the word, is that if you know your basic prefixes and suffixes, they help you determine the meaning of a word. And they're important clues, especially if you're taking a standardized test where they say we want you to find the word with the opposite meaning. Sometimes just knowing the prefix can give you enough of a clue, even if you don't know what the root means, to find the opposite. Um, we've got a few examples on the board and we want to go through those briefly just to show you the importance of prefixes, how they can help you in your test taking strategies, and how they can help you understand the meanings of words. So prefixes give clues as to a word's meaning. Knowing them can help you find the word with the opposite meaning on a test. So words like uh, prefixes like pre, um, here we think preoperative, preop, that means before the operation, or prescient, uh, pre meaning before, and scient from the word science, which means knowledge, so to know ahead of time. So prescient is to know ahead of time. Uh, pre-game show, the, the part that comes before the game. So pre means before, the opposite of pre is post. Post-operative care, the care that happens after the operation. Post-game show, the show that happens after the game. So pre is before, post is after. If you realize this, 
um, opposites, then if you see a word that's got a pre-prefix on it, then you look for a word with a post-prefix on it if the test is asking you to find the opposite. Another thing would be pro and d. So pro means for, as in pro-life. Uh, someone who is pro-life is for life. Um, uh, DE is the negation, so deconstruction. To deconstruct is the opposite of, uh, or the negation of construction. Construction to build up, deconstruct to destroy. So pro uh, meaning for, D is uh, usually a negation, pre before, uh, post after. Knowing your prefixes can be critical, um, especially if you're not sure of the whole word. You can say, well, let me break this word up into its prefix, its root, and its suffix and see if I can't uh, decode just from that minimal information the proper answer on the other side. Now obviously when you're taking a test if you know the right answer you always go with the right answer but if you're struggling if you're not sure this is a strategy you can use. You can look at the word break it down and say hmm here's the prefix and I know it means this and I'm being asked to find the opposite. What's the opposite of this prefix? Then I've got my answer more than likely. Caution though. Caution. Con and pro are opposites, but congress is not the opposite of progress, although some people might disagree. Uh, that's more of a joke in terms of congress being the opposite of progress, but uh, con and pro are opposites, but you have to know and be careful sometimes. Anyway, that's been just a basic introduction and uh, overview of the importance of prefixes as a test-taking strategy of knowing what they mean uh, to help you determine the meaning of a word and also to assist you if you're being asked to look for the opposite. If you know what the prefix means and you know what the opposite of that prefix is, it makes it a snap to find the right answer. If you'd like to learn more about this or related matters, underneath this video you'll see a link. If you'll click on that link, it'll take you to the website that has that information. While you're on that website, you'll also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. It is important to use different types of sentences. Using different types of sentences adds variety to your writing. So by using different types of sentences, you make your writing more interesting. It's more appealing to the reader. So there's three types of sentences. There's the simple sentence, complex sentence, and the compound sentence. So you want to try to use all types of sentences in your writing. So a simple sentence is just a subject and a verb. This is what we'd call one independent clause. Hannah ran through the meadow. So we have the subject here, and we have the verb ran. And so that's all that's here. It's just a complete thought. It's enough to be a sentence, but it's not anything more. Then we have a complex sentence, which is an independent and a dependent clause. So I call this an independent clause because it can stand alone. It has a subject and a verb, so it's a sentence. It doesn't need anything else to make it more of a sentence. And so this says, instead of watching a movie, he read a book. So here we have a subject, he, and a verb, read. Now, he read a book could be a sentence alone. So that's the independent clause. The dependent clause is instead of watching a movie. Because instead of watching a movie isn't a sentence. I couldn't just come up to you and say, instead of watching a movie, you'd be thinking, okay, instead of watching a movie, what are you going to do? So this is the dependent clause. So together, the independent clause and the dependent clause form a complex sentence. Then we have a compound sentence, which is two independent clauses. So here we have the sentence, we ate burgers. So we have the subject, we, and the verb, ate. And then, then we ate burgers, or then we ate dessert. So we have we as the subject and ate as the verb again. But these are two sentences. These are two independent clauses. Because both of these clauses could be sentences by themselves. I could come up to you and say, we ate burgers. And that would be a complete thought. Or I could say, then we ate dessert. That would be a complete thought. So by joining these two together, we're forming one sentence. But we're forming one sentence out of what could be two sentences. So that's two independent clauses, which makes a compound sentence. So when you use all of these, it gives your writing variety. It makes your writing more interesting. And also, by using different types of sentences, it makes your sentence length differ as well. So generally, your simple sentences are going to be kind of short. And sometimes your complex or compound sentences will be pretty long. And so by having different links to your sentences, it makes your writing more interesting.
Characters are an essential part of every story. So characters can be classified into two main categories, flat and round. The terms flat and round pertain to how much the character changes throughout the story. So flat characters have little change in personality throughout the story, or many times no change in personality. They're very predictable. They're always the same. And because they're predictable, they can be considered not very interesting. So that's why they play small roles in the story. The main characters of a story are never going to be flat characters. Instead, they're going to be round characters, because round characters incur lots of change throughout the course of a story. So they play the main roles. So flat characters and round characters both contribute a lot to a story. Obviously, round characters are needed to play the main roles because they're going to be developing and changing a lot, and that's what moves the plot along. The plot is moved along by changes in characters' personalities. Flat characters are also needed, however, because they play the smaller roles in the story, the supporting roles that make the main characters very interesting. So when we're talking about round characters, you probably heard me use the word development. And that's what authors try to do with round characters. They try to develop the characters. And it's the development of the characters that moves the plot along. If the characters stay the same, the characters stay the same throughout the entire story, then the plot's not very interesting because the plot's not going to progress very much. So round characters are essential to moving the plot along. But the important thing to take away from this, if you remember one thing, is that characters can be split up into flat characters and round characters. Flat characters having the same personality and round characters changing in personality throughout the story. Theme. Theme is the overall idea of a piece of literature. So think about the lesson or moral of the story that the author is trying to get across to you. One thing to remember is do not confuse theme with plot. Plot is what the characters do. It's the action of the story. It does not have to do with the overall lesson or message that the author is getting across. Now obviously what the characters do is going to help you understand the theme, but plot and theme are not the same thing. Plot is going to be more about human nature, society, and life in general. There can also be more than one theme. The author may have one overall message, but there may be a few messages in there, or you may be able to find more than one theme besides the main controlling theme of the story. Some questions to ask yourself are, what is the lesson or message? And some common themes are, Man struggles against society, man struggles against nature, overcoming adversity, the importance of family and friendship, man struggles with faith, sacrifices bring rewards, and honesty is the best policy. So for all of these, I want us to look at the story of the tortoise and the hare from Aesop's Fables. And this shows you that there can definitely be more than one theme for one story. Now, all of these may not be what Aesop had in mind when he was coming up with this fable, but I was able to see all of these themes in the story. The last one, I couldn't come up with something for, but I've got a good one for that as well. So, man struggles against society. You've got this tortoise who feels like he's going to keep going and he's going to try to win the race. But all of society is against him and saying, oh, that hare has got you beat. He's way faster than you. I don't know why you think you're fast enough to beat him. So I'm sure that tortoise was struggling against society's views of him. Another one would be man's struggle against nature. The tortoise is struggling against the nature of his self, how he's made. He's obviously not going to be as fast as the hare. Um, he's going to have to go up hills. He's going to be fighting against the very nature of his self where the hare is made to go much faster. Overcoming adversity. Just simply winning the race, the tortoise ended up winning 
even though no one expected him to do it, even though people were probably telling him, oh, you can't do that, the hair is always going to beat you. The importance of family and friendship. Now, I've talked a lot about society, telling the tortoise he couldn't do this, but I'd like to think that the tortoise had some family and friends on his side that were urging him on, that helped him feel like he could actually go through and win this race. Man struggles with faith. The tortoise had to have faith in himself. The hare was very, very cocky. He felt like he had this race won so much so that he went and took a nap where the tortoise didn't do that. He had faith in himself and knew that he could do this if he just kept going, if he gave it his all. And then sacrifices bring rewards. The tortoise sacrificed that nap that the hare took and in the end he won the race because he just kept going. Now, the moral of the story they give you is slow and steady wins the race, but I can see all of these themes in that story. Now, honesty is the best policy. I couldn't really come up with one for, but you can always look at Pinocchio. Pinocchio, every time he told a lie, his nose grew. It was not a good thing. Every time he lied, something bad happened to him. I won't ruin the whole story for you, but everyone knows about the growing nose, which is a sad punishment for someone who is not using honesty. So it's showing you honesty is the best policy. So whenever you're reading a story, you can look at what the characters are doing to figure out what the plot is, but remember the theme is different. The theme is going to be the controlling idea in that piece of literature. And you want to ask yourself, what is the lesson or moral the author is trying to get across to me? When it comes to summarizing text, you need to be able to state the main point of a story. So a summary is just stating the main point of a story. So you're reading an entire story, and then you're just taking the important things and writing about that. If you've ever looked at the back of a book, you'll see a summary on the back of a book. And so there's a whole book that may be 100 or 200 pages, but the author summarizes it on the back of the book so that you get an idea of what it's about. So that's what you're trying to do through a summary. So there's four main points that you should remember when writing a summary. Focus, like I already said, on the main idea of the story. Focus on the key points. In other words, you're not worried about little details. You're worried about the important things that contribute to the overall storyline. The third point is focus on the conclusion of the story. Because in most stories, there's some kind of problem. The whole plot is based, based around some kind of problem throughout the story. Then eventually that problem is resolved. And so that happens in the conclusion of the story. So look at the conclusion of the story and talk about that too in your summary. So you're going to be talking about the main idea of the story, the key points, the problem, you know, maybe a little bit about the main character, and then talk about the end of the story and how the character ended up dealing with his or her problem. And then the fourth point is kind of a longer one. Focus on important information the author wants the reader to know. So throughout the story you may notice certain points that the author really wants the reader to understand. And so look for that important information and include that in the summary as well. And so a summary is typically one paragraph in length. So it's not very long because it does not need to be long because you're not focusing on details you're just focusing on the overall story. And so remember, again, you're looking for important information. And so we're not interested in details. Try not to even think about the details, just look for the main idea of the story. Now, in some cases, you might be writing a summary for a long story with multiple settings and scenes. And so a summary may be a few paragraphs in length. And these paragraphs give the main points of each major part of the story. And so the summary of a long story always in includes a conclusion to wrap up the story as an entirety. So like I said, the summary is usually going to be one paragraph, but if it's a really long story that has lots of different settings, lots of different scenes, lots of different problems throughout the plot, you may, did, may need to write a paragraph for each main point or major part of the story. 
And then for that summary, you're going to write a few paragraphs, and then you're going to write a conclusion that's going to kind of summarize that whole story. And so only make a summary longer than one paragraph if you feel like you cannot include all the important information in one paragraph. So again, a summary states the main point of a story. Inference. Inferences are conclusions that a reader makes using clues in the text. So an author may not explicitly say something, but they leave little hints behind and you have to connect the dots to form a conclusion. And inference is different than making a guess because it is based on evidence. So you read, you pick up on those clues or hints that the author leaves behind, and you put them all together to form your inference. So let's look at a couple of examples. Charlotte's toddler is in bed asleep upstairs. She hears a loud thump and then loud crying. So knowing that the toddler is in bed asleep and then hearing a thump and crying, you can infer or Charlotte can infer when she's at home that her toddler fell out of bed. Now our example doesn't say the toddler fell out of bed and it doesn't say Charlotte ran upstairs and found her child on the floor but because you know the kid was in a, in a bed sleeping and then you hear a thump probably against the floor and then crying because the kid is hurt or scared from waking up in the middle of the night on the floor unexpectedly, Charlotte can infer that her toddler fell out of bed or the reader can infer that that's what, happening, what happened whenever they're trying to process the story and figure out what the author was trying to tell them with these clues. So let's look at another example. Nolan sees cookie crumbs on the floor and chocolate around his son's mouth. So cookie crumbs on the floor, chocolate around his mouth is going to tell you that Nolan's son got into the cookie jar. And it may not be the cookie jar, it may be that he got into a pack of cookies, but you don't really know the rest of that. You just know that if there are cookie crumbs on the floor and chocolate around his son's mouth, that the kid got into cookies somehow. So you can infer he got into a cookie jar or a pack of cookies without knowing, without the author explicitly saying that to you. And that's all it is. That's all inferences. Reading something and coming to a conclusion. A lot of the times it's really obvious things. If you see a lady come into a store and she's dripping wet and it's raining outside, you can infer that she doesn't have an umbrella. So some things are just common sense. They come to you. You don't even realize you're making an inference. But in the end, an, it, an inference is just a conclusion that a reader makes based on evidence. A comma is there for the purpose of breaking the flow of text. So basically we could define the job of commas as to break the flow of text. So commas should come in places in sentences where we would naturally pause if we were speaking that sentence. And so one way to test whether or not a comma is necessary is to pause very deliberately at each comma when reading. Because it's important not to overuse commas because they lose their effect if they're used in places that they should not be. So it's important to know when commas are needed and when they're not needed, both for your own writing and maybe if you're revising someone else's work. So let's practice. Right here we have a sentence that says, as you can see, the car is very old. But we have a comma right here. So if you're just reading this to yourself inside your head, you may have trouble determining whether or not the comma is needed. So try reading it out loud and deliberately stopping at the comma. As you can see, the car is very old. Well, that makes sense because if you were speaking this, you would be explained to someone and you would say, as you can see, the car is very old. So the comma there is needed. Another example is this sentence right here. Natural disasters, such as tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes, are not very common here. 
So here we have three commas. Excuse me, we actually have four commas. And so two of these commas are there for the purpose of setting off this phrase, and the other two commas are there because we're making a list. So first, let's look at, take a look at the phrase. Natural disasters such as tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes are not very common here. So really, we could omit everything in between these two commas and just say natural disasters are not very common here. So that's why we're using commas here, because we could set this off. But if you were speaking this, you would say natural disasters, such as tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes, are not very common here. So both of those commas are needed. Now when you're reading the list, such as tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes, you don't really need to pause in between each item in the list. But here the commas aren't here as much to break the flow of text. In this case, they're just distinguishing between the different items in the list. So this is kind of an exception of when you wouldn't follow the rules of commas are only there to break the flow of text. But in general, Hopefully you can see kind of a better idea of when to use commas. So where the check marks are, those were all the correct places to use commas. And then right there and right there as well. You just want to make sure that you use commas when you need them. And if in doubt, then generally leave the comma. But many times you want to leave out commas when you can because they slow down your writing. Because someone feels like they need to mentally pause if they're speaking. They need to actually pause when reading that comma. And so make sure your, your comma usage is appropriate. Fractions. A fraction is a number that is expressed as one integer written above another integer with a dividing line between them, like x divided by y. So for example, 3 fourths. In this fraction, 3 fourths, the top number is called the numerator, and the bottom number is called the denominator. The numerator is the part that's being considered, while the denominator is the whole. So in this fraction, 3 fourths, we could take a pie shape and cut it into four pieces. That's our whole. And the part that's being considered is 3 fourths. So 1, 2, 3. So now you can see how much of our pie we're talking about, 3 fourths. We can manipulate fractions, and we do this by multiplying or dividing both the numerator and the denominator by the same number, not by adding and subtracting. We manipulate fractions to do many things. One thing is to compare them. If we were to compare 3 fourths and 2 thirds, we would first need to find what's called a common denominator because in order to compare them, I need them to have the same denominator. So I can tell which one's bigger or if they're equal. So we'll take 3 fourths and 2 thirds, and we're going to find a common denominator. When you do that, you want to look for multiples of the denominators. And the least common multiple will be the least common denominator. So the multiples of 4 and 3, 4 is 4, 8, 12, 16, etc. 3 is 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, etc. So the least common multiple between 4 and 3 is 12. So that means I want to change this fraction to something over 12. Same with my other fraction. Uh, what I'm doing is creating an equivalent fraction. 3 fourths is equal to something over 12. So I'm going to multiply my numerator and my denominator both by 3 to achieve that denominator of 12. So 3 times 3 is 9. And for, so our fraction is 9 twelfths. And then for 2 thirds we'll do a similar thing. 
we want to change our denominator from 3 to 12. So we multiply 3 times 4 to get 12. And we must do the same to our numerator. 2 times 4 is 8. So now we can easily see which fraction is, not, is larger. 3 fourths is a, equivalent to or equal to 9 twelfths. And 2 thirds is equal to 8 twelfths. Well, 9 out of 12 is definitely more than 8 out of 12. So we could say that this fraction 3 fourths is bigger than this fraction 2 thirds if we were to compare them. So let's talk a little bit more about equivalent fractions. All of these fractions are equivalent fractions because they all represent the same value. 2 tenths, 3 fifteenths, 4 twentieths, 5 twenty-fifths. And we could see that they represent the same value more easily by simplifying our fractions. So we said we can manipulate fractions by multiplying the numerator and denominator by the same value. Or we can manipulate them by dividing the numerator and denominator by the same value. So if we wanted to simplify this fraction 2 tenths, we would just divide the numerator and the denominator by the same value. Both 2 and 10 are divisible by 2. So we divide our numerator by 2 and our denominator by 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1. 10 divided by 2 is 5. We do the same thing to our next fraction. 3 and 15 are both divisible by 3. So we divide our numerator by 3 and our denominator by 3. 3 divided by 3 is 1. 15 divided by 3 is 5. 4 twentieths. Our numerator and denominator are both divisible by 4. So divide by 4. Divide by 4. 4 divided by 4 is 1. And 20 divided by 4 is 5. Finally, 5 twenty-fifths, numerator and denominator are both divisible by 5. 5 divided by 5 is 1. And 25 divided by 5 is 5. So as you can see, all four of these fractions are equal to 1 fifth. One-fifth is the simplest form of these fractions, and they are all equivalent fractions since they all have the same value, one-fifth. Decimals. Decimals use place value to represent an amount. To read a decimal, like we have here, first read the number to the left, as a whole number, followed by and, then read the number to the right of the decimal, followed by the last place value. So this number would be read as 641 and 5,129 ten thousandths. This number could also be represented as a mixed number. 641 and 5,129 ten thousandths. Let's look at another decimal. 5 and 8,139 ten thousandths. We could write this number as an improper fraction by taking the five plus, this would be eight tenths since it's in the tenths place, plus one hundredths, plus three thousandths, plus nine ten thousandths, which would give us 58,139 ten thousandths. 
So we've seen a decimal in decimal form. We've seen it represented as a mixed number and also as an improper fraction. You can think of multiples as like counting by that number. So for instance, the multiples of 2 would be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, etc. The multiples of 3 would be 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, etc. The multiples of 4 would be 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, and so on. Sometimes you're asked to find the LCM of two or more numbers. The LCM is the least common multiple. Least meaning the smallest, common meaning the same, and multiple. So if we wanted to find the LCM of, let's say, 2 and 3, the least common multiple of 2 and 3, so the smallest number that 2 and 3 have in common, would be 6. So that's the LCM of 2 and 3. The LCM of, say, 3 and 4, the very smallest number that they have in common would be 12. And you can find the least common multiple of bigger numbers, like say, the least common multiple of 12 and 15. So 12 would be 12, 24, 36, 48, 60, 72, etc while 15 would be 15, 30, 45, 60, oh. So if we were finding the LCM of 12 and 15, the smallest number they have in common is 60. So the least common multiple is 60. In math, we have rational numbers, and we have irrational numbers. So we're going to be taking a look at rational numbers, which have four different categories, and those are integers, percents, fractions, and decimals. So we're going to define each of these. Even if you're already somewhat familiar with them, we're going to go ahead and define them and give some examples. So starting out with integers, integer is a positive or negative whole number or zero. So 9 would be a whole number. It would be an integer because it's a positive whole number. Negative 6 is an integer because it's a negative whole number. Then, of course, 0 is an integer because we said it was. And so now we move on to percents, which is kind of a more complicated way to say percent is a part per 100. So an example of a percent is 20%, which we could also write as 20 parts per hundred. But the important thing here is just, you know, what a percent is, like 20%. Then fractions, which is a proportion. So an example would be 20 divided by 10, or 2 divided by 4. And of course we have decimals, so this is where we have an integer, maybe 1, maybe 89, maybe 0. And then we have a decimal place, and then we have numbers after the decimal, like 20.53. So we have an, our integer, we have a decimal, and then we have numbers after the decimal. So integers, percents, fractions, and decimals are all rational numbers, usually. There are some rules. So in order to be a rational number, to summarize, it either has to be an integer, like we talked about. If it's a number like 9, negative 6, 0, it's always going to be a rational number. It gets more complicated when we come to fractions and decimals. If it's a fraction, it has to be an integer divided by an integer. And this integer cannot equal zero. So it's an integer divided by an integer. So 7 divided by 4 
cuts it. That works. Now, decimals are a little bit more complicated because it either has to be a terminating decimal or a repeating decimal. So an example of a terminating decimal would be something like 2 divided by 4. From that you get 0 0.5. It ends right there at the 5. For a repeating decimal, you do 1 divided by 3 and you get 0 0.3333. It goes on forever. But notice we're getting the same number every time. So really you could erase all of these 3's and just put a line over the 3 showing it's a repeating decimal. What you don't want is a decimal like pi where you have 3.1415926. 5359, five, it just keeps going on and on. So it, there's no ending to it, so it's not a terminating decimal, and there's no pattern to it, so it's not a repeating decimal. That's what an irrational number is, one that just keeps going like this. These numbers, they have basically a stopping point. And so that's what we're looking for. And so the reason I say that a fraction has to be an integer over an integer is because when you divide an integer by an integer, you get a clean number. You get a, a decimal that's repeating or terminating. When you start dividing a decimal or a fraction by a number, or a fraction by another fraction, that's when you're going to start getting messy. So really, if you're wondering whether a fraction is a rational number, what you can do is go ahead and divide it out and then look at the decimal and decide whether it's terminating, repeating, or non-ending. And that's how you can determine if it was a rational number. Ratios. A ratio is a comparison between two quantities. You can think of a ratio like a fraction. And since it's just like a fraction, a comparison of two numbers, it is treated a lot like a fraction, meaning you're going to simplify it anytime you can. Let's look at this problem. Suppose a sampling of fish from a local pond contains 12 bass, 8 catfish, 38 minnows, and four trout. What is the ratio, so the comparison of two numbers, of bass to minnows? Now, when they ask you this question, they're telling you exactly how to set your ratio up. <clears throat> Since it says bass to minnows, we read left to right. We also read from top to bottom. Since a ratio is a fraction, then they're telling you what your numerator should be and what your denominator should be. So our, our ratio is going to be bass to minnows. And now we can substitute how many bass and minnows we have. According to our problem, we have 12 bass and we have 38 minnows. So that ratio would be 12 to 38. But again, since this is a fraction, we're going to simplify it if we can. And 12 and 38 do have a GCF of 2, so we're going to divide 12 by 2 to get 6, and we'll divide 38 by 2 to get 19. Therefore, our ratio of bass to minnows is 6 to 19. But that's not the only way we can write a ratio. We could also write it as 6 to 19, or as 6 to 19. And these all mean the same thing, and they all give you the same information, that for every 6 bass in the pond, there are 19 minnows in your pond. It is important, though, the order of your numbers. Since the ratio they were asking for was bass to minnows, your bass number should be first and then your minnows number. So make sure you put it in the right order. That is very important.